Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Washington Institute. Uh, our topic today is to focus on Arab-Israeli cooperation. Over the past few months, Israel and the Arab partners, old and new, have ramped up their diplomatic engagement. U.S. and Israeli officials have met with leaders from Bahrain, Egypt, Morocco, and the UAE in various locales, while Abu Dhabi finalized a milestone free trade agreement with Jerusalem. At the same time, however, the nuclear negotiations with the U.S., Iran, and its European partners are still in a stalemate, and the Arabs are wondering about what is the direction of American involvement in the Middle East. So we want to discuss all these different trends. What does it mean for the region, its security paradigm, and what does it mean for the United States? And we're just so delighted to have, a, a, I think, an all-star uh, virtual policy forum panel with uh, Nikolai Mladenov, Ebtisam El Kitbi, Zohar Palti, Karim Hagag, and Zohar Palti. And I will moderate just to tell you a little bit real quickly about each, each one of our people. Uh, Nikolai is the Siegel Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the Washington Institute. He previously, ser previously served as the UN Special Coordinate Coordinator for the Middle East. And uh, he was also the Foreign Minister and Defense Minister of Bulgaria. He's been also a member of the European Parliament. We're also joined by Ebtisam El Kitbi. She's a founder and president of the Emirates Policy Center and the first Arab woman to lead a think tank in the Middle East. She also serves on the board of directors of the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington and is a founding member of the Emirates Human Rights Association. We're also joined by Zohar Palti. He recently served as the head of the Political Military Bureau of Israel's Ministry of Defense. That's the top policy position at the Ministry of Defense, working with the Israeli Defense Minister. He currently, previously, he held a senior position in the Mossad as the head of its intelligence directorate, and before that served as the deputy head of the research division of the Israeli Defense Forces Intelligence Corps. We're also joined by Karim Hagag. He was for 25 years in the Egyptian diplomatic corps. He's currently a fellow at Harvard's Kennedy Center Middle East Initiative and a professor of practice at the School of Global Affairs and Policy and Public Policy at the American University in Cairo, known as often as AUC. So I think we have a really an, an all-star panel and the, the, the trick will be just distilling all, what all they have to say about all these regional developments that are going on. And so maybe we'll, we'll start to understand some of the bilateral dynamics and then looking what it means for, you know, re for the region. So um, Dr. Eptasam, maybe I'll start with you, which is, you know, we, we heard about this Emirati-Israeli free trade agreement. We hear that there's over a billion dollars in trade at just so shortly after the Abraham Accords, over 400,000. Uh, Israelis have come to the Emirates during a pandemic, which makes me think the potential is much greater. Can you give us a sense of like, what is driving this from an Emirati perspective? Uh, how much of it is Iran? How much of it is Houthis? How much of it is a perception of American retrenchment? How much of it is looking at the future of the Emirates beyond the age of oil? I would say none of that fit. It's more about UAE uh, wants stability and believes that uh, none of its goals will work if there is no stability and in the region and security. So this is the main motivation for that. Now, this stability cannot, of course, be with the Iranian arsenal, with the Iranian uh, nuclear power, with the Iranian missiles, with the Iranian militias, and cannot be also with any uh, non-state actors. And of course, and uh, of there is no normalization, as, and and the Palestinian cause will still 
there. So that was uh, the main uh, motivation for uh, Emirati move and take that uh, bold step out of the box and trying to find a solution for that cause which lasts for seven years without any uh, moving forward rather than ba back uh, forward. And you know the rest of the story, which is uh, what was the condition for normalization has been achieved. So it wasn't a stab on that. So it cannot be a real normalization if it's not people to people. And that's why uh, we said in the beginning, this is a war peace. It's not a cold peace, which is the first time between all those who um, uh, signed the agreement before. This is people to people. And uh, uh, for the first time, the Israeli were coming to UAE, welcomed by the people. They didn't find themselves alien. And also when the people of UAE went to, to, to Israel, felt that this is something also, they've been welcomed by uh, their counterparts. So this is, this is the main issue which has not been in the uh, other agreement. And um, Ambassador Karim Haggag, so the Egyptian-Israeli agreement, there was the very first peace uh, agreement uh, going back to Sadat's visit in 77, Camp David in 78, the treaty on March 26, 79. Uh, so that relationship has been also, you know, has been much about, there's been some economic aspects recently with the, with, with the gas, uh, but there uh, often has been a very strong intelligence uh, relationship. How do you see it changing? In other words, what I was struck by the Sharm el Sheikh uh, summit, where you had President Sisi, you had Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, and Prime Minister Naftali Bennett sitting together discussing problems or even at an Egyptian energy conference when President Sisi got up and welcomed uh, a, a handicapped um, Israeli energy minister very warmly, and he knew that would send a certain signal. Uh, it seems that the, that relationship has, has gotten stronger lately. So how do you see this new resurgence? What drives it and how far can it go? Well, th thank you, David. So, uh, as you said, e Egyptian-Israeli cooperation is not a, a new development, right? So, e Egypt was the first country to reach out and establish a, a very solid peace uh, with Israel. Uh, and since then, we have engaged in numerous areas of cooperation uh, with Israel uh, on trade, on energy, on agriculture, uh, on security. So th this is not a new development by any means uh, with regards to Egypt's relationship uh, with Israel. At the same time, you know, to echo something that uh, Ibtissam mentioned, uh, Egypt has always believed that cooperation uh, agreements with Israel should not come uh, at the expense of, and in fact should uh, underscore the need to move uh, in a very concerted way on uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, right? To address what has been the long-standing, the, the most long-standing uh, issue of Israel's occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And Egypt has moved in tandem to really support uh, the peace process uh, when it comes to uh, the Palestinian issue. So this is not a new uh, development for Egypt. Now, what is new or what, what I think the, the, the new hope is for the region is that the expanding expanding the circle of Arab-Israeli cooperation can be leveraged to push forward the peace process towards a viable two-state solution to address this long-standing problem in, in the issue. And that is what has prompted Egypt to support uh, the Abraham Accords, to host, as you mentioned, uh, uh, meetings both uh, in Egypt and to participate uh, in the recent uh, Negev summit uh, be between the foreign ministers, uh, hosted by Israel. So the, the real hope is that we leverage uh, this widening circle of peace to address uh, the, the long-standing issue of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Has the Ukraine crisis, Karim, has that had also an impact in terms of there were a lot of tourists coming from Russia and Ukraine, 
and now they can't go to Sharm el Sheikh. So now there's Israel started direct flights there, or the problem of wheat reserves. To what extent do some of the crises of the moment serve as an impetus to bring these parties together? Yeah, well, it's it's no secret that the economic repercussions of Ukraine have hit the region uh, quite hard. Uh, so yes, and whether in terms of wheat imports, whether in terms of tourism, but again, to to emphasize the the issue of functional cooperation with Israel on issues of tourism, on issues of energy, on issues of trade, this is not new, right? Just to give a very quick example, right? Egypt signed the Qualified Industrial Zones Agreement with Israel, which allowed for Israeli imports uh, into uh, Egypt that allowed Egypt to export goods into the U.S. market duty-free. That agreement goes back to 2004, right? So just to give an example of how well, long-standing- 400,000 Egyptians are, uh, are employed, thanks right. to them. So the, 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 the functional uh, cooperation with Israel on issues of tourism, commerce, security, I mean, that continues apace, right? There's really nothing new in that. Whether that cooperation, again, can be leveraged uh, in the context of the repercussions uh, resulting from Ukraine, yeah, yes, clearly. I mean, that, that would not be a, a new development uh, in our relationship. Right. Okay, before I go to Zohar, I just want to say for our viewers that are watching, uh, if you're watching on Zoom, you go to the Q&A function if you have questions. And if you're watching this on live stream, you go to policy forum, one word, at Washington Institute, one word, dot O-R-G to ask your questions. I'll be trying to monitor it. I can't promise I get all the questions in, but I will try to do my best. So Zohar, over to you. Um, you know, you see these developments, uh, closer ties with Egypt, uh, a very promising start with the Abraham Accords in, in the United Arab Emirates, ties with security and in Bahrain and in Morocco. Your boss, the Defense Minister Gantz, uh, I should say your former boss now, you're retired um, as of a month ago, but you know you were with him in Morocco and Bahrain. I mean, I, you've spent 40 years of your life uh, on uh, working on Israeli security from when you started as a recruit in the army. Um, did you ever dream that, that this was possible, that, that you would be there for, to witness this history? And how do you see um, this, these developments? First of all, David, it's great to be over here and thank you for inviting me. Second, it's always good to be back in the Washington Institute platform over here. It's a great home uh, to have a discussion like that. And I would try to share with you. I think that uh, President Sadat used to say, this is a piece of the Braves. And I think that the Abraham Accord is also kind of a piece of the Braves this time. It's a bit, uh, who led it? It's, of course, His Highness uh, uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, and, of course, President Trump, and His Majesty, His Majesty the King of Bahrain, His Majesty the King of Morocco, and, of course, the uh, former Prime Minister of Israel, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. And I think that this is the biggest development in the last three decades since the peace with Jordan in 1994. And it's so great, so great for a guy like me that used to work in the shadows and things like that to land with Al Al airplane in Morocco, in Marrakesh. Um, sorry, over there we landed. It was in Bahrain or in Morocco. I don't forget. I don't remember. With the same plane that took President Sadat to Israel it, from the Israeli Air Force. And Benny Gantz, when he used to be uh, chief of staff and right now the minister of defense, he was one of the soldiers that used to uh, guards uh, and to protect the visit of late President Sadat in Israel. Yeah. So it was very symbolic for all of us that used to serve so many years to see an event like that. And it's really for us to describe something like that. It's, it's very emotional, of course. And the beauty is that after 73 years back, used to be 70 years of the states of Israel, the second tier, the third tier of the Arab countries understand that Israel is not necessarily the problem in the region, on the contrary. Israel, in a way, is the opportunity in the region. And we can have some debates or arguments regarding the Palestinian issue or other issue, and it's okay. 
And it's okay that some people also will criticize or have a different opinion, but at the same time, we are building so many things together. And it seems to me it's good to the region, it's good to the people of the countries that we just signed peace with them. And it's great to the people in Israel. I mean, the economy right now is between seven to 8% growth in the last year <laughs> in COVID. And uh, hopefully I, it will maintain like that. The other issue, of course, it's the first time that we're starting conversation over here with the full glass, meaning the good things that are happening in the region. And immediately we'll come back probably to the Iranian issue and to the other things like that. But really from a positive point of view, I think it's outstanding. And over here, I have to remind all of us, the national security of Israel is relying, first of all, about the relationship and the connection with the United States of America, bipartisan. We really don't care who is sitting in the White House. We share the same values as the Americans. We are relying on the Americans' friendship 1,000%. And thank you so much for so many people over here that are affiliated with the Washington Institute and with other Jewish organizations and supporting Israel. This is a treasure that we must continue to keep it. And Israel have to invest and to do a good job regarding uh, the Jewish community that are over in Israel. And we are not doing good. We have to do much more than that. And secondly, it's the peace with Egypt, that Egypt is so vital to the region. The peace with Jordan, that we have the longest border with Jordan, and Jordan is essential. The safety of Jordan is essential to the security of Israel. And right now, the Gulf, France, and of course, Morocco, we miss the Saudis. Inshallah, the Saudis will come as well. We have time. We are not going anywhere. And whenever the Saudi will decide to join us, we will welcome anything that they want to do uh, a peace with us and to join the Abraham Accords. We need to see the Omanis joining the Abraham Accords as well. And uh, hopefully uh, the Indonesian as well one day. Thank you. All right, Amb Ambassador uh, Nikolai Milanov, you are someone who was, as the Middle East envoy, you were a very rare bird, I would say, that uh, you, know, you were dealing with some of these Gulf states um, and dealing on the problems of Gaza and uh, worked out the, the Qatari. Uh, you were a key figure in working out the Qatari subvention uh, on a monthly basis to kind of keep Gaza afloat. Uh, and you are, are very much, you're, you're in the Middle East a lot. You're also, uh, you know, a former European foreign minister, defense minister. The world is, is riveted by the Ukraine uh, and that war with Russia. But from your perspective, as someone who was both a practitioner inside the region on behalf of the United Nations and somebody who, you know, sees it how it's seen from the outside, how do you assess, um, you know, these regional developments from uh, 2020, you know, whether it's with the Emirates, whether it's with uh, Bahrain, I, we should mention Sudan, which is tragically going through a civil war now, and Morocco, how do you how do you see its significance? Well, David, David, thank you for the question. I think much has been said about the historic importance of the Abraham Accords, um, and and I fully agree with everything. But I just want to highlight one aspect of it, which I think um, is is critical from an Israeli perspective, and one aspect that is critical from an Arab perspective. Um, the Abraham Accords send a very powerful emotional message to Israelis. Um, and that is that the Arab world is accepting them as people who live there, who will have always lived there, and who will always live there. Um, and this uh, message has perhaps more value than all the uh, amounts of billions of trade or investment that, that has been made since then, because it's a very powerful uh, idea. You're here the to Israelis stay. Israelis are not under siege. They shouldn't. You're not under siege. You're not visitors. This is your home. Right. Exactly. And it all, but it also sent a very powerful message to the Arabs, I think. And that was the message for tolerance. Um, this is uh, uh, something that the United Arab Emirates in particular has been uh, critically uh, important in taking the leadership on. The three Abrahamic faiths, um, Islam, uh, Christianity, Judaism, um, are endemic to this part of the world. And so are the people that carry them. And they have to have ways in which to, uh, to, uh, to talk to each other, to understand each other, to have differences, obviously, 
uh, but to also find the commonalities. Um, this message of tolerance was, is extremely important for a region that has been torn by um, radicalism, religious radicalism, uh, for so many decades now. Um, if there's one thing that I would really like to see going forward, that is not just the expansion of the Abraham Accords, but the deepening of the Abraham Accords beyond um, you know, economic relations, political relations, security relations, vital for the, uh, for the region, but into cultural relations, educational relations. Um, uh, that is uh, the real power of, this, uh, uh, of these two messages. Um, and in that sense, I think you know, we are only at the beginning. What happened um, almost two years ago is the first paragraph of the first page of the new Middle East. Um, how we write the rest of these paragraphs and the rest of these pages is now in the hands of um, leaders in, in the region. Um, the leaders of uh, the UAE, Israel, Bahrain, Morocco, America have shown, uh, uh, have shown you know, great courage. Um, hopefully that courage will be shown by others as well. Exactly. So maybe I, back here to Ebtisam, can you give us a sense of its regional potential, you know, have you just heard what, you know, what, what has been said by Nikolai, which is this, this has enormous potential. I mean, do you think the idea of regional cooperation, does that become a block for stability in the Middle East? I know these words can sometimes people think this is like, a, you know, I didn't say a grand alliance, but some sort of a, a, a block of, moderates does it or is it completely contingent upon the role of the u.s if the u.s is involved in the middle east it's bigger if the u.s is less involved it's smaller or if the u.s is less involved it means the arabs and israelis have to join hands and they have to draw closer very hard and difficult issue david because after a naqab uh, meeting that it's there was agreement for uh, regional cooperation and regional security structure. But also here it raised the question, US will, when it's withdrawing from the region, that this is the formula and this is can formula will deter the Iranian and their activities in in the region and do these all signatures uh, they are uh, standing on the same level uh, is a V era this is also a question the other question also uh, the Palestinian cause and how this also can be a step forward to find a solution for this issue to bring stability, to bring security, to curb all Iranian uh, claims that uh, uh, what's doing in the region is because of Jerusalem, is because of uh, Palestine. The, the actors also, how they, how much they will be involved and uh, enthusiastic towards this uh, structure, and how long it can last? Because there are spoilers in the region, and they have no interest to keep this uh, regional cooperation, uh, security architecture uh, in the region. It will depends on the wills and how long they will uh, continue. Also, U.S. withdrawing from the region, it doesn't mean that it should withdraw from its uh, supporting this kind of cooperation and, and uh, structure. As Nikolai said, it's not about how many it will involve. How, when we say it's not about quantity, it's quality. Those actors, um, they are in that uh, cooperation regional. Their willingness to cooperate together 
and committed uh, to that. This is the main issue. And, and Karim, how do you, seeing it from Cairo, where you live, do you, um, do you see the regional cooperation as like an ad hoc thing on, you know, on, on this energy issue, we have a gas forum. On this tourism issue, we have a consortium. Uh, or do you see it as something where the sum is greater than the parts and that it's, it, it could be a, a regional block of moderation and stability that, you know, beyond the bilateral economic benefits, that is, would be a new geopolitical fact in the region. Yeah, thank you, David. So I think we have to make the distinction between the ongoing uh, cooperation between countries of the region, including Israel, on practical functional issues. And, and again, that, that started uh, with Egypt, followed by Jordan, and has now been expanded due to the Abraham Accords. And, and between this idea of regional blocks, you know, r radicals versus a moderate bloc. And I think that that idea, I think, has, has always been around, uh, you know, the idea of radicals versus moderates. But I think the, the idea that you can look at the complexities of the Middle East and reduce them to the idea of these, you know, two countervailing blocks, I think is somewhat deceptive and, and masks what I think is a much more complex reality, right? The, the, the conflicts in the region are too diffuse. The interests are too divergent, right? The threat perceptions are not necessarily aligned. And I think the countries of the, the parties to the Abraham Accords uh, emphasize this idea. I mean, I think the, the UAE, for example, has underscored repeatedly that, that this is not meant to be a block or an alignment uh, that is necessarily directed at any other state uh, in the region. You know, most recently, the Egyptian foreign minister after the Negev uh, summit again underscored that this is not meant to be uh, an alliance that is uh, that is against uh, any particular state uh, in the Middle East. So I think we, we have to make that distinction. What I think we need to focus on is how we can leverage these areas of cooperation to address deep-seated conflicts in the region, right? The conflict in Syria, the conflict in Yemen, uh, the conflict uh, with Iran, and of course, the, the Palestinian issue. And here, I just wanna underscore something very important that Zohar mentioned, that, that Israel is not the problem. And that's the message that we have been emphasizing since we made peace with Israel, right? The, the problem is not Israel. The problem is Israel's occupation of Palestinian lands. And so it's the conflict that's the problem. And I think that distinction that we've always emphasized hasn't necessarily been very well understood by the Israeli public, right? The, you know, the public sentiment seems to feel that criticism of the Israeli occupation is equivalent to criticism of Israel. But that's not necessarily the case. So we need to address in a very concerted way the, these conflicts. But I think the idea of, uh, of two uh, very well-defined blocks, I think masks what, what is a much more complex reality in the region. So, okay, we're gonna get to the Palestinian issue, but just in terms of the other conflicts you mentioned, Syria, Yemen, uh, some of the others, how do you see the, these groups of states working together to hopefully, you know, stop bloodshed um, and bring more stability. Well, I think that 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 is where we need very uh, mature, very concerted diplomacy. Right, each actor has a, di a different role in each of these conflicts. Right, so the the United Arab Emirates has had a very active role along with Saudi Arabia in the Yemeni conflict. Um, Egypt, of course, has a, a long-standing diplomatic involvement in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The, the, a number of Arab countries are now reaching out to uh, Syria to see whether you know, this, this new phase of the conflict and a new relationship with the Syrian regime can hopefully provide an opening for a more uh, concerted effort to address uh, the, this very uh, difficult issue. Uh, and of course, we have to think about Iran. I mean, how potentially can, can we involve Iran in a regional de-escalation process for the Middle East? So each country is playing a different role uh, in these conflicts. 
And it will be up to, I think, a, a very concerted diplomatic process to see how we leverage these relationships to address the, these conflicts. Zohar, over to you, which is you've been very involved as one of the top people in the Israeli Defense Ministry of, of really focusing in on something that is not known to many Americans or many people in the Middle East, which is the idea of CENTCOM, the idea of here is one place, uh, Tampa, Florida is its, its headquarters. Of course, it has you know offices in the Middle East that deals with, it's the Middle East command of the United States. And for most of Israel's 70 plus years of existence, now Israel just celebrated 74th year, um, for almost all of it, it has been part of the European command. But now the Arab militaries are willing to sit with the Israeli military. So is this seems like an incredible opportunity for Israel to sit under, under the same umbrella of the United States Central Command, the, the Middle East Command, CENTCOM as we call it, and to discuss common problems, whether they're in Iran, whether they're in Syria, whether they're in Yemen, uh, maybe the Palestinians, although that's going to require its own kind of uh, challenges. How do you see this new opportunity as part of this new era for Israeli uh, regional relations? So I spoke about it before, but I can elaborate regarding the fact that right now we're under CENTCOM, it's also historically because as you know, David, so well, for so many years, um, the commanders of CENTCOM usually haven't been in Israel because of the Arab. Uh, it was like a taboo for uh, many decades. Exactly. It, 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 it uh, the kind of, uh, in the last, it faded, faded in the last faded, years. Uh, but for a while, you know, they wouldn't talk to Israel. They thought it would jeopardize their position talking to Arab military. Exactly. It seems to me that the Israeli um, approach regarding the Iranian issue, regarding some other things that we took care about them, like the Syrian reactor and things like that, show the region that not necessarily Israel uh, should be avoided, meaning the connection with her. And as you mentioned, in the last decades, things fade away a bit. And we are so happy that right now we are part of the Middle East in CENTCOM and things like that. I think that CENTCOM can contribute a lot, although I have to mention that UCOM have done an outstanding job. And UCOM with all UCOM the is the European command. Exactly. Right. And the fact that they have all the ability with their vessels to protect the states of Israel in the state of a war regarding air defense and things like that, this is vital. And um, at the same time, we are happy to be Part of CENTCOM. Whether it's open opportunity, the answer is yes. We will learn each other, we will train together, we will uh, take um, um, uh, direct flights uh, to Abu Dhabi, to Bahrain, to the region. Uh, the generals, the, 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 the lieutenant colonels, the major will speak. This is something great. But then again, I'm so proud that the Abram Accord started not on the security level, that it's also as if Tissam used to say, people to people. And the fact that we established um, direct flights and trade zones and um, other uh, commercial initiatives, this is much more important than security. And you know the strategy of the Israeli defense uh, since 48. We will take care about our business by our own. And this is how we're so proud regarding the relationship with the Americans. Never from 48, we ask America to save Israel. We're doing the job. We know how to do it. The line that Israel says, you know, defend itself by itself. Exactly. Now, if somebody wants to join us and to be part of us, as we say in the region, Alan was silent. But the, we are not going to impose ourselves. And on the contrary, we will take care of business. And if the countries, for example, radicalizations or terrorist activity or the Iranian threat or things like that want to join us, more than happy. But we have to do it in a very responsible way. We have to do it slowly. They have to go to know us. We have to go to know them. It's, as Nikola used to say, it's the beginning of a relationship, of a beautiful relationship. So why immediately to push everybody to do things that you have to get to know each other? And of course, military issue, it's complicated. 
It's a different language. It's a different methodology, different platforms. But we're getting there. We're getting there, and Suncom is a beautiful platform for doing it. Okay. Nikolai, as someone who's you know seen the big picture here, the role of America, how central is it? Uh, you know, here, Zohar is talking about how CENTCOM is going to facilitate all these military exchanges. They're not just multilateral because when people sit together, I'm sure they will deepen bilateral understandings, but maybe they can also enhance regional stability. So does this regional cooperation, what I'm trying to get a hand of, um, you know, is it, is it, is it filling a void where they feel America is taking a half a step back? Can it survive if America is not as deeply engaged in the Middle East as it is today? Uh, how essential is it that America maintain its leadership uh, for the Abraham Accords to grow, not just bilaterally, but to foster the, the regional cooperation that we all seek? Let me jump to the end of your question and answer with a yes and a no. Yes, it can survive if uh, America uh, uh, moves further away from the region. Um, should America move further away from the region? No. Um, and is any one of the countries uh, in the Abraham Accords or the countries that came to the Negev summit, you know, who all have a strategic relationship with the United States, are any of these countries wishing to see America leave? No and a very, very thick no with a big underlining. Um, America plays a critical role in providing security um, for the region, both at a political and, the, and, and at the security level, but it also provides um, a sense of leadership and direction. Um, and that is very important for everyone. Um, the relationships that the countries have bilaterally with the United States can only be strengthened if they have a multilateral relationship among, them, among themselves. And if they open these relationships to other countries beyond the region um, in the context of the Abraham Accords. Look at one of the um, recent um, uh, successes, uh, completely unpredictable at the signing ceremony of the Abraham Accords, of the Abraham Accords. And that is that you would have a format in which the United States would sit with uh, the UAE and Israel and India, um, and would be talking about technology, and would be talking about maritime security, and would be talking about uh, trade. Um, now, think this through to the end. How many other countries around the world um, can such a format be extended to? Uh, not against anyone, not um, uh, against another country, but for uh, uh, development of relations um, and all that. And I see. Um, a great opportunity, um, which requires the United States to participate in. I'd love to see the European Union find a, uh, a format with which it sits together with um, uh, the Abraham Accord countries, but not just with the Abraham Accord countries, because I don't think it's fair to uh, either to Egypt or to Jordan uh, to, 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 to have two, you know, to talk about two groups of countries. We should talk about everyone together. And that was the beauty of what happened in the Negev summit is where you had everyone come uh, uh, come together um, and talk about opportunities of, of cooperation. So I think, again, this is perhaps the second paragraph of the first page that we're writing now uh, or beginning to write now. But um, um, the opportunities there are extremely important. And they will reflect also, to a certain extent, the common um, threat perception that the countries will have. Um, given the realities of the Middle East, but also the opportunities that they see for growth. Um, and in an environment of which we have today with the Ukraine crisis and with the global, the shakeup of the global uh, order, um, such formats, such discussions will be even more important uh, uh, than, uh, than we can perhaps see. And they will create opportunities for solving, I think, down the line, other uh, challenges in the region. Um, we've talked about radicalization, we've talked about Iraq briefly, Lebanon, Syria, uh, but there is also the underlying uh, problem of uh, resolving the question of uh, the Palestinians. Um, and in that sense, uh, that question may not be at the top of everyone's mind today because of all the other realities of the region, but it is an extremely important question that cannot uh, uh, remain uh, unresolved for a long period of time now.
Yeah, hundred percent. And we're going to get to the policies. I got questions for you on that. But you know, Zohar, I'm going this way now. Uh, you know, we talked about the idea of deepening the accords for the existing countries. And Nikolai, very correctly in my view, pointed out to all these permutations, like the Quad. You could do it with so many different countries to do all these different projects. Uh, you know, if it's Emirates, Israel, U.S., uh, India, or, or there's so many other permutations. But I know something on the viewer's mind is not just the deepening of the accords, but also the broadening of the accords. And I know there'll be, I'll get questions on this, so I might as well ask you now, uh, which is Saudi Arabia. And to what extent is the Saudi-Israeli uh, breakthrough idea that people think could be coming, how much of it is held uh, linked to the paralysis that is marked U.S.-Saudi relationship? It, it almost is as if Crown Prince, um, you know, Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, saying, you want me to normalize uh, with Israel? Well, you normalize with me, you Americans. So how much are these two issues linked? that the Saudis think Israel is a great card for them to play and they don't want to give it away for free and they want to see an improvement of U.S.-Saudi relations? I don't want to get into the, uh, the spot of the relationship between you and the Saudis, but I know to say something like that from Israeli perspective. It's vital to the region that the Saudis will come to the Arab ports and will establish open relationship with the state of Israel. Saudi Arabia is the biggest country beside Egypt in the region. Saudi Arabia is 50 kilometers from the Israeli border. Some people tend to forget it. Um, Saudi Arabia, the stability of Saudi Arabia is vital to Jordan, is vital to the Gulf states at all. It would be great if Saudi Arabia were without, as Michael, I mentioned right now, without the facility of the Americans, it's not going to happen. With that reason, the other reason is less important. We need Americans to push this issue. Now, I know that there are some issues uh, over here in Washington, but it's so important that a good relationship between the United States of America and the Saudi will maintain. And it's so important that America will continue to back up Saudi Arabia in the region. I hate to say the friction, I hate to see the friction between the Americans and the Saudis. We'll have to find a way how to fix some of those issues. Um, over here in the region, although the Saudi are not on board yet, uh, we are facing a tremendous challenges. And the big umbrella for the region is the United States of America. And I have a different point of view. The Americans are not living in the region. The American in the region. You've got uh, thousands of thousands of troops spread all over the Gulf, in Bahrain, in Abu Dhabi, in Saudi Arabia, in Qatar. Um, you don't need to... Uh, uh, deploy forces in Israel, as mentioned, but you are so supportive with all the aid, the military aid that you give the states of Israel, but be, be more than that, you give the strategy back to Israel. And I don't see them, an American in Syria deploying north of Syria, they are deploying in TANF, they're supporting with FMF 1.65, uh, I think, billion dollars in Jordan, and it's vital to the Jordanian economy over here. America is all over, and America is supporting Lebanon when there is a crisis right now. I don't want to be <laughs> to say how many things America is doing in the region, but if somebody thinks, now, I'm aware, and because I'm speaking with all my friends in the Gulf, that there is some notions in the Gulf states that America should do something more. What's the more? It's between you and them to figure out what's more. But I'm saying to our friends in the Gulf, there is no substitute to the United States of America. And I'm saying to myself and I said to the Americans, guys, even if you want, sometimes you're a bit fatigued from the, all the mess in the Middle East. So go to a weekend, the log one, switch batteries or change batteries if you're electric and come back because there is no alternative to America. Okay, another uh, perception that's out there and we heard from Kareem and I we want to get back Kareem and Ebtissam on this, but Azar, I'll just ask you this too, which is some people say, oh, this whole Abraham Accord is an anti-Iranian alliance, that Israel needs these Gulf states and Morocco and as part of its, somehow of its effort to thwart 
Iranian nuclear ambitions. Can you address that? As I said before, I think it's coming from a positive point of view of all of us, not negative, because when you say against something, you start with the negative. And I prefer to see the full glass over here. We're coming with really with open heart and open mind to this kind of relationship. Now and again, Israel in the last 40 years is dealing with the Iranian aggressiveness all over the Middle East and with the what the potential uh, of the Iranians to get them, God forbid, military uh, uh, nuclear capabilities. And we've done it with all the Arabs. So whether we know how to do it and we know, understand that this is our responsibility, it is with the help of the United States and the European states. Now, if the Arab will join us along in this issue, again, alam wa But it's not that we came to this real just because we need it for the Iranian cause because it's diminished the importance of the Abraham Accord. The Abraham Accords are much bigger than this problem, this challenge, and the other ones. And I prefer to see the joint venture that we can do in order to elevate the way of life in the Gulf, in Jordan, in Egypt, in Israel, and all the surrounding country. Sadly, Syria and Lebanon are not in the game, and I don't see in the near future that they will be in the game. But let's take it to the positive side now and again. It's so important that the Iranian will see that the region is speaking and talking together. The aggressiveness of the Iranians, we're sick and tired to see what they're doing in the region. September 14 attack against the Saudis, they took down most of their oil production. 2019. 2019. And the fact that to compromise and challenging our friends in Abu Dhabi in the middle of the day, launching uh, rockets and uh, UAVs, attack UAVs against civilians from uh, in Abu Dhabi. And they are continue to support the Houthis in Yemen and supporting Shia militias to kill the coalition force and American soldiers and launching from there against the, the Gulf. This have to be stopped. And this um, Abraham Accords have a potential to establish over here another thing, whether it's the main thing, whether it's the first thing, I'm not sure about it, but it will come along the way. So at Sam, I mean, we heard what Zohar just said about uh, the recent Houthi strikes. According to the media reports, it has brought the Emirates and Israel even closer together. Uh, I don't know if you could comment on that, but uh, if, if you can, please do. But also what Nikolai said before about that Abraham Accords is also about you know, an opportunity for cultural and educational coming together. I was very struck going to a construction site in Abu Dhabi on, when I was there mm -hmm. in November, the building of the Abrahamic house, where they're going to have a mosque, a church, a synagogue, all the same size, all equidistant. It's not like one is in the middle and the others are at the edges. And it's a message of religious moderation and hope. And I just, you know, I, I want to ask you if you feel that the Abraham Accords is people become sometimes disillusioned with the Middle East. They think, ah, oh, it's too complicated. Uh, there's no hope. But what if a message comes from the Middle East that says, we want the new discourse uh, on, on the satellite televisions about the three religions working together, including Islam and Judaism, where sadly there is, the media has not always brought religions together. So what I'm just trying to project ahead. What is realistic and what is not realistic in your view in terms of a new discourse uh, between cultures, between religions? You know, David, uh, the problem is not with the religions. The problem with the people were part of people. Uh, I would say those extremists whom they politicized the, the religion or the sects. And that's what, what caused the, the, the problem. Uh, the message also, why it has been, I mean, you can, you can form any agreement without putting in, in but, but the, the beauty of that, that it was based on the uh, Abraham, uh, Abrahamic cause that, Regardless, we are Muslim, Jews, Christians, we are all sharing the same values and, and norms. So it should be nothing uh, 
pull us uh, away from each other. Other side also, uh, this is the cultural side which you can bring people to people on it. What Zoha said or you mentioned about the security, security is not only military security. Now, in this cooperation between UAE and, and uh, Israel, that's other dimension of security. There is food security, there is water uh, security. You have other dimension, which is uh, climate change, also part of security. So, uh, and here, you don't need US as a guarantor for this security as a facilitator, right? Now, if you're moving from that guarantor to facilitator, that's good. But we have heard, yes, that commitment US is not leaving. But how about all the global powers find their interest, okay, in encouraging this kind of cooperation based on uh, religion, involving countries from other part of the world, because we see that many, many of those uh, conflicts, either in our region or others, is also part of it because ethnic and religious uh, conflict. Look to Balkan, look to, this is the issue, look to Ukraine itself. And uh, so what we, uh, me, as one of those countries who signed that, I wish that is, is reach a, a stage, a level that can give that model, which can be transferred to other part of the world. Uh, and we saw that during COVID, the whole world was uh, cooperating with that, which we have this also uh, now. The, um, I mean, because I mentioned like anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, I mean, the media could sometimes accentuate the negative. And I think if I read Nikolai correctly, we need some way to bring people together to foster greater religious understanding. And I, I see the Abrahamic house is a good example of that. But I, I just wonder, the window seems open now for this new discourse. A am I right? You uh, need a new narrative, yeah. okay? You need a new narrative because also you have a new generation, okay? Those whom they played with the entire religion, okay? Kind of those fanatic people and they also benefiting from that. We are entering a new era now. Okay, digital era. You need a new discourse. You need your media to use it. You need uh, to educate uh, the the people dealing with the religion, ulama, uh, rabbis, uh, preachers. In the, in the, so you need those to bring them. Okay, this is the the idea of that when you mentioned that the uh, Abrahamic uh, house uh, in UAE, that those were started, the, the wars, because the wars between uh, those people. So you need also to start from that. Okay, Karim, you heard what, um, you know, Ebtisam just said about a new generation. And this seems like part of the hope of the Abraham Accords is that you have a new generation that didn't, doesn't remember 1948, 1956, 1967, 1973, all the Arab Israeli wars. In the case of the Gulf, you know, they 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 didn't fight in any of the wars, even the older generation. But the resonance of uh, of of the past doesn't resonate maybe in the same way. That seems to give some hope that this is not just a peace between governments, but a peace between peoples that could take hold. And I'm, I'm asking you, do you think that that is a, a good basis for hope? This generational shift of, of people. We keep hearing how the Middle East is the youngest region in the world, that like 70% uh, of the people are under 30 or 35. 
does does this generational shift does that give this region a chance for greater reconciliation? Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely true. That there is a new generation in all of our countries, right? In the Arab world, in in Israel, in the Gulf, in Iran, in Turkey. And that new generation has aspirations, right? Aspirations for a better future. And that's what I think the, should be the impetus for moving forward on many of the issues we've been discussing, right? To, to echo something very important that Nikolai mentioned, right? The impetus for the Abraham Accords is a positive imp impetus, right? And it's a positive impetus based on a, a vision for a better region, right? A more hopeful region a more peaceful region, uh, hopefully a more stable region. That future, I think, has to be built on several pillars. Right? One of them is regional cooperation, as we've been discussing, and that, that's proceeding. The other pillar is on based on conflict resolution. Right, We have to solve these deep-seated conflicts. Right, we, we can't envision a better future with civil wars, with failed states, with occupation, right, with geopolitical competition. right. With with a, a growing militarization of the region, and then of course the third pillar, as as Ibtisam mentioned, is about moderation and coexistence. I think each of these pillars have to proceed in tandem. Now this this is a complex endeavor, right? But but to to bring it back to your question, right? Many of these issues are not about the past; they're about the present. Right? We have civil wars in the region today. We have the situation of occupation in Palestine today. This is not about 1947. It's about today. And so we have to really come together to address these problems today in order to secure a better future for the region collectively for tomorrow. Because I think as, as your question implies, if we fail to meet these aspirations for the coming generations, then I think we're left with a less hopeful future for the coming generations. So at this time on the Palestinian issue, I mean, on one hand, and I was in Ramallah in, in uh, February when I was in Israel. And I said, you know, you need not just a peace process with Israel, you need a peace process with the United Arab Emirates because you've had some bad blood between Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, the crown prince, and President Abbas on the Palestinian side. Uh, the Emiratis feel insulted. And uh, the Palestinians put out the narrative that this is a bypass road around them to weaken their leverage. But it could also be a bridge, could it not? In other words, the same projects that the Emirates is funding in Jordan for solar energy and water with Israel and more electricity, it's a fantastic project. And it seems to me that here's a case and, and uh, Karim and I might have a, a, a respectful disagreement, but it seems that whatever cooperation existed, the new normalizers could open up more political space for some of the old normalizers. But can, do you see a chance of some sort of Emirati-Palestinian reconciliation that would enable um, this, uh, the Palestinians to view it as, as a bridge and not as a bypass? because you bring a lot of experience, the, the Emirates, you have a lot of capacity uh, to, to be part of a solution in the West Bank on, on the economic side. And by the way, I wanna be clear, I think it's, it goes without saying, economics is the beginning of a solution, but it does not substitute for the political dimensions. So I'm just asking you, how, how do you, imp how can there be an improvement of Emirati-Palestinian relations, because I even look at what happened in Ramadan over, uh, and then I'm gonna wanna also hear from Nikolai and Zohar on this too, but it seemed to me that all what happened on the Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, Temple Mount, however you want to call it, that the Palestinians said, okay, the Emirates feel they could go ahead without us, and the Middle East is going ahead without us, maybe we need to jump on the train, but we have one thing that is a potent symbol that they cannot get around, which is photos on television, visuals of, of things at the mosque. And this is the strength of our weakness as Palestinians, the Achilles heel of these Abraham Accords. 
that if conflict continues in Jerusalem, this will have an impact even, you know, in different reaches of the Muslim world. So I guess I'm asking you is, is there a way to improve Emirati-Palestinian relations and to help bring you in as part of the solution, as opposed to some Palestinians depicting you as, as this is a bypass road? Well, the the balls in the PA. Uh, in their background. court. Yeah, in their court. Yeah. Okay, it's not whatever uh, UAE done, they are always suspicious. Okay, it's normalization. They normalize with Israel. Why they don't? It's it's something I don't think, I will not say Palestinian. I would say Abbas yeah. and his people. Okay, and of course Hamas. Of course. Uh, uh, this is it has nothing to do UAE spent uh, 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 he tried to to build projects uh, shake its hand with them brought Abbas there even okay but it's about them it's how we bypass them they bypass the Egyptian and the Jordanian when Arafat went to Oslo nobody knows Okay, so you don't say something, uh, it's not uh, true. I think they wanted something, okay, and always, and you, you know, was this norma normalization uh, based on freezing the uh, uh, annexation? Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. Why that was the condition? Yeah. How, can, how can they say that we, we bypass them? We could make it without putting this condition, yeah. okay? We can make it. Right or not, so I don't find it. It is there. It's not. You, I, to my knowledge, I know that UAE tried many times. They are not accepting the uh, uh, aids from UAE, and they are accepting it's coming from Israel. So a question we get, uh, and I see it in the in the chat also is, can the UAE play a role in Gaza? Can you imagine that? Uh, because Israel has had some issues with the Qataris and others. But some would say, well, why would the UAE go there? It could be destabilizing. I'm, I'm just curious what, what's possible and what is unrealistic. UAE is not going there to conquer Gaza. It's to help the yeah. people. And you know how is the situation in Gaza under Hamas, right? How is the, the, the infrastructure? Many things. Uh, even with all these money going from from uh, the Qataris. Where does it go? It's in Hamas people's pockets. It doesn't go to the people to 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 help them, to improve their uh, uh, economic life or their life in, in, in general. So if UAE will go there, it will go to the help of people. But always this is how they think that they are suspecting whatever UAE is doing. Okay, this is the problem. I am I'm saying, if Hamas is there, there will be no, only if the Israeli will it also, because what's doing now with the Qatar is money, that is like Penadol. The, the more they are taking then, and after two months, they're sending uh, a strike against uh, Israel because they want more money. Right. So I turn to you, uh, Nikolai, and then I want to hear from you, Zohar. But Nikolai, you're a peacemaker. You were the UN Middle East envoy. How do we use this as a bridge, uh, this fantastic Abraham Accords with all the potential this panel has been talking about? How do we somehow, uh, I mean, Jordan is able to use it right now, right? With, with the electricity, solar, water, uh, an incredible project supported by the Emirates. And I think other Gulf states would support too. How is there a way in your view to make this view as a bridge so um, that somehow that people feel the benefits of this in the West Bank as well. Well, David, I I think that from day one of the Abraham Accords, um, and I've been very clear about this, they're not an obstacle, the Abraham Accords are not an obstacle, a bypass, they're an opportunity. Um, and they're an opportunity for the Palestinian people uh, to uh, really uh, not just improve their situation on the ground, which is terrible, both in the West Bank and, and even more so in Gaza, 
but to also focus on a political resolution of the problem. However, I don't believe that that is something that will happen quickly um, or will happen without a Palestinian and an Israeli leadership committed to such a discussion. Because um, with all due respect to um, all the countries in the region, outside of the Palestinians and the Israelis themselves, there are two countries that are critical to peace, and that is Egypt and Jordan. Everyone else has a supporting role that they can play. Um, and whether it's on the humanitarian front, whether it's on the development front, whether it's on the political front. But um, if you look at today, there are on the economic front, there are certain um, you know, little rays of light coming through that potentially can have a very serious impact on uh, improving the lives of Palestinians in the West Bank in particular. Um, let's think of Jordan Gate. Um, a project between Jordan and um, and Israel, um, supported by the United Arab Emirates. Um, it is a stone's throw away to get goods from Jenin um, and from the West Bank through that future Jordan Gate to uh, to be exported to to, to world markets. Um, um, these are small openings that we need to seize on, um, but with a full understanding that, as you said yourself, um, this is not a replacement for a political solution. Now, unfortunately, uh, the track of the peace, peace, Middle East peace process has been dead for quite some time, well be before the Abraham Accords. Um, the current global turmoil and the war in Ukraine uh, doesn't help. Um, it's it, Under the current circumstances, it's impossible to think of uh, the United States, Russia, the European Union, sitting together to talk about um, about Palestine. Um, but perhaps, um, you know, no crisis should go to waste. Perhaps the fact that everybody else is looking elsewhere uh, should um, push some uh, leaders, both in uh, Palestine and in Israel, to really sit down very quietly and very honestly, seek the support of their partners in Egypt and Jordan, seek the support of the Saudis, the Emiratis, the, uh, everyone else in the region, and, and work out a formula that will actually you know, move, or fo move us forward on the resolution of this conflict. Because without a political process, um, every day we risk the situation uh, to deteriorate. The pictures that uh, the world saw uh, during the Ramadan this year and last year of Hamas flags on top of Al-Aqsa um, mosque in Jerusalem. Um, I'm sorry, they were offensive to, to, to Muslims as well um, and to Arabs because you shouldn't politicize holy places. You shouldn't have party political flags flying um, uh, uh, on top of, uh, uh, of, of religious monuments. Um, religious monuments should be places of reflection and, and, and prayer and, um, and bringing people together. Um, um, but we also have seen how you know the ineptitude in, in some respects by the Jerusalem police, by the Israeli authorities, um, has stirred this trouble uh, uh, as well. Um, in fact, we need, and all of this becomes possible and becomes um, amplified because there is no political process uh, to show the Palestinian people that their challenge uh, is uh, being addressed uh, by the leaders. Uh, again, it goes back, in my mind, it's always gone back to the basic question. Leaders in Palestine, leaders in Israel, they need to show the leadership. Everyone else uh, can support, can facilitate, um, can help isolate the radicals, can push away those who will be disrupting the process because there'll be plenty of those. But we need to see that, uh, that leadership um, as we saw uh, in the Abraham Accords because we often forget now uh, as Aktizan pointed out, that you know part of the Abraham Accords, when they were signed with the United Arab Emirates in Israel, included stopping the very, very realistic prospect. And I can speak uh, on this from experience: the very, very realistic prospect of annexation in the West Bank, which would have been disastrous both for Israel um, and for any future prospect of normalization with uh, with Arab countries. But stopping that was one part of it. The other part of it was leadership. Let's see the leadership on the Israelis and the Palestinian side that now really wants peace. And I assure you, if that leadership is there, uh, we will see 
uh, and the countries of the region, the Arab countries of the region, supportive of, uh, uh, of such a process, each in their own way and each in, uh, and with their own capacities. So, Zoe, you heard Nikolai, and I want, I want to know, is there a way to leverage all these regional moves um, so it could be more of a bridge uh, economically, politically? I mean, how, and how worried are you? This is a separate point. By Ramadan being in the last two years used as a, a political wedge issue in a way, um, that the Temple Mount became the, the, the Al Aqsa Mosque became this magnet uh, for disturbance. Uh, I mean, Israel's standard view was always this if the issue of is, is, is that it's an Israeli Palestinian conflict, it's solvable. Once it becomes a, a Jewish Muslim religious conflict, it becomes unsolvable because it becomes about religious absolutes. So how worried are you that that there's that we're maybe near an inflection point um, to try to transform this uh, as as a religious issue or to use religion um, to politicize the conflict? So the last thing that Israel wants is to see any religious clashes. Israel is open to all the religious. As you know, we have Muslim, Christians, Druze, so many uh, streaming the Jewish uh, uh, community. The last thing that we need to see is tension regarding uh, religious. And the most important one is to keep the stability and to keep the status quo in the Temple Mount, in Haram Sharif. And this is exactly uh, what the Israeli governments in the last decades instructed all of us to tolerance and to respect that everybody will pray quietly over there. Where is the problem? The problem right now is, first of all, that we left Gaza, we pulled out all the settlements, all the IDF, and what we got in return, Hassan missiles, like 24-7. We still remember the second intifada. It was only 20 years ago. And we saw what happened in the last two, three weeks inside Israel. When some fanatics are butchering people in the middle of the street with axes and things like that. With all due respect, and I have a lot of respect to Nikolai and to everybody to speaking about two state solution. I suggest that we will start with something else. First of all, the Palestinians will take the word of responsibility and will decide that they are doing reforms. And before they're preaching to the Emiratis what to do and what not to do, or to the Bahrainis, they have to look very carefully about themselves, where, they are where they're delivering to their own people. And in the last year, I know that we've done a lot, leading by the Minister of Defense. There is more than 100, 150,000 Palestinians that are working in the settlements and inside Israel. We open for trades from Gaza to come, at the beginning, 10,000, later on, it went to 20,000 simultaneously after the last operation that they've done in Gaza. Now, each one that thinks that Israel will tolerate that somebody is jeopardizing our stability in Jerusalem and will decide in the middle of the day or the middle of the night to launch a Qassam to Jerusalem and we are not going to respond, is probably is not living in the region. And each time that we will see that the Hamas is trying to compromise, and right now they are the incitement and the sense that we are getting from all over that they want to see the Jerusalem is flaming. The central command in Israel and the IDF is doing an outstanding job in order to pull things off. And most of the West Bank is quiet. Jenin used to be the hearts of this problem. We gave the Palestinian Authority the permission to launch an operation and they've tried to do their best. They haven't succeeded so much. So we have to get the IDF into Jenin area and to clean. And it's not enough because we saw what happened in the last few days, terrible terrorist attack in Elad. And right now the tension is not in the fact that the PA, and David, you know it quite good, they're very fragile. They're, very, they're not really, not, they're not good, a good job. We still have the coordination with the security services, and they're doing quite good over here. We have to keep and to maintain everything that is working 
And the Palestinians have to decide that they are focusing right now on economy investment. And if somebody wants to invest and to do something with the Palestinians from the outside, is welcome to do it. Israel is not, um, on the contrary, we will like to see it happening and things like that. When it's coming to political solution, two-state solution, I think that we should look about the Israeli government, the Palestinians. It's not on the cards right now, and I suggest not to deal with it. All right, so let me just ask a final question and drawing on, again, what people have been asking. And I want to ask each of you this question, and we'll try to do short answers. Um, to what extent do you feel the hope for regional cooperation, as we've witnessed in the last few months, how much of this, how confident are you that this new edifice, or however you want to call it, uh, that these new sets of relationships are solid and will, you know, and that the, and this tree will draw deep roots, or do you feel it's fragile? And if the hope of, you know, peace between peoples doesn't emerge and that the, the tree doesn't really have deep roots. So I guess it's a question of how, I guess we're all hopeful, but how optimistic are you that these new sets of relationships, and again, some of the regional relationships are older, they're not as new, but but the fact that there are now more and more of them, how how confident are you that the that these that this regional cooperation will grow or is it on the other end episodic that in five years from now we we won't remember it um how hopeful are you optimistic are you confident are you Eftisa? i am i am i am because you know look to your own. how many wars they went to at the end they were exhausted and also the region see the turks see all of these uh yeah there are some crises but nobody will will spend all uh their life in, in, in conflict at the end if they reach of course and i think this is what i'm seeing it's happening that they are reaching uh zero sum formula everybody is exhausted from fighting and, and bloodshed in the region so they are trying to even the iranian yeah they, but of course they want it on their terms of condition but it 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 is there i have the hope people cannot this is i mean the conflict is not the the normal peace is normal you see us after covid that we like to have things in person we don't want to stay on 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 the screens I'm, at the end, and with the new generation, with the new hope, they, they definitely we will reach uh, more cooperation and peace. <clears throat> Kareem, knowing that same question <laughs> about your level of confidence and Egypt that's dealt with problems of Hamas and things like that, to what <clears throat> extent will the spoilers try to spoil and will the people who are the you know, anti-spoilers, what, what, what Eptisov just said, to what extent do you have confidence that these people will prevail? So to use your analogy, David, right? If we want to build an edifice, a new edifice for the region, that edifice cannot be built on one pillar alone. So we have a, a growing solid pillar, hopefully, of uh, regional cooperation. We need regional peace. Right. I think it's very interesting that for, for decades, is, Israeli politicians have, have told us, the old normalizers, to use your analogy, right? if only the region reach out, re reaches out to the Israeli public and shows them the promise of peace, right? that will uh, uh, serve as an impetus to, to move on the two-state solution. I think, well, that promise is there, right? It's, it's within reach, and we, we've all been discussing this for, for the last hour. The irony is that despite the fact that now that that future is is we, we could see it, we, we could it's it's being realized right in terms of cooperation. The irony is the reality that uh, Zohar described for us, a, a reality of tension on conflict for both sides, for Israelis and Palestinians and no movement on the political solution. 
right? So the, the future is there if we grasp it, if we realize it, if we leverage these new relationships to address the problems of today so that they don't uh, impact negatively the future that we want to build tomorrow, right? That, that, that's my hope, that we could build this edifice, but it needs these different pillars, right? The pillar of regional cooperation, a pillar of peace, and hopefully a pillar of moderation. Right. I do think it is worth noting that when the Emirati decision on Abraham Accords happened, uh, there was a poll where it was because part of the package was no annexation of the West Bank. And you saw at one point some polls close to 50 percent of the Israelis wanted the uni unilateral annexation. But then when people said, would you rather have normalization or annexation? 80% of Israelis who cannot agree whether it's light or dark outside, 80% went for normalization. That to me is a, a, is a hopeful sign that when faced with that sort of choice. So Zohar, and then I'm going to conclude with you, Nikolai, but Zohar, how do you, what is your level of optimism? Some, somebody's worked for 40 years in, in, the, in, the, in the area of Israeli security um, to witness what you've witnessed being with Defense Minister Gantz in in the Arab world uh, over the last year. what What's your level of confidence? Confidence about what? That this new edifice, this new structure of normalization is going to, you know, that it's solid, that it's, that, that the roots of this tree are gonna dig deep. It's already said it, we need to work on it. It's like a relationship. We need to put a lot of salt, a lot of, fertilizers, a lot of water, and eventually we'll have something over here. We start a great. It seems to me that we are uh, step by step are doing great things uh, with the Moroccans, the Bahrainis, and of course the Emiratis. Uh, I, I suggest to all of us not to try to jump a project from today to tomorrow, to understand that there is also next year, that we are building a relationship for decades ahead, and there is time to work about everything. Simultaneously, we'll need the support of the new Arab country to join the peace with us to try to settle down and to ease down the tension between uh, the Palestinians and us. I'm very confident that the Gulf is mainly the Emiratis and the Bahrainis eventually will pursue the Saudis to join this issue. It will take some more time, but eventually they will come. So I'm very optimistic. We always used to be optimistic in the region. We always, and you know, this is our national anthem, and uh, basically the Israelis and the Jewish people, they're optimistic. Even in hard times, part of our DNA is to be optimistic. We're never pessimistic. Even in rough times and things like that, we know we will we'll over jump everything and all the obstacles. And right now, the last year, the last two years with our Arab our, our countries, uh, neighbors, we've done great. And I'm very, very optimistic that we'll continue to do it. At the same time, we'll have to face with tremendous challenges in Israel. Is to, we have so many balls in the air. Lebanon, Syria, the Iranian nuclear issue, the Iranian regional activity, Gaza. When we're speaking about two-state solution, I suggest that first and foremost, the Palestinians will decide who is the state, who is the Palestinian state that represent the Palestinians. Gaza that are launching Qassam missiles to Israel like every five minutes and not speaking with the West Bank or the West Bank that right now uh, have to go to a kind of transition and are not speaking with the West Bank. When the Palestinians will understand what they were, where they want to go, we will be there. You get the last word, Nikolai. So your level of confidence, someone who worked as a peace mediator in the region, someone who goes back, you were just there. What is your level of confidence that this new cooperation will be able to strike uh, deep roots? I'm very confident. Um, and I'm confident because in the uh, almost two years since the Abraham Accords have been signed, I've seen how that cooperation um, has taken root already. Um, and of course, there are challenges. There'll be differences. There'll be diff difficult periods. Um, the world, you know, throws things at us that we can't even begin to to, to expect. Um, it's not just about the foreign ministry diplomats getting together, or the or the security people getting together, or even the tourists traveling. Um, it is 
about opening up to different societies and understanding the depths of those societies, understanding the symbols that these societies have. Um, you know, um, I found particularly people in the Gulf uh, to be extremely resilient. Uh, you know, the Emiratis have a, a national tree, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, the Gaf tree. It's a tree that uh, actually lives in the desert, but it's green. Its roots go very deep down. It blossoms twice a year. Um, it's, it's a bit of a miracle. Um, this, I think, symbolizes very well the resilience of the people um, of the UAE, of Bahrain, um, of other parts of the, uh, of the region, which is shared by the people in Israel, who also live in a harsh environment and who've also had to you know, uh, work on you know, making a garden out of the desert. This brings people together. Um, now, there are many, many, many political obstacles uh, on the way um, that need to, be, uh, they need to be handled. But what is perhaps the real, um, um, the real uh, fertilizer to, 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 to the growth of, the, of peace in the Abraham Accord countries, and, and that, by saying that, I also include Egypt and Jordan, um, is that if you hold the, all the countries, and people are free to answer the question, uh, do you want peace or war? Do you want weapons, nuclear, conventional, or you want to be able to live in uh, uh, peace and development? The answer will be absolutely clear. I mean, it doesn't matter if you ask that question in Yemen or Iraq, whether you ask it in the Sudan or uh, in Lebanon, uh, or whether you ask it in Israel, or, 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 or you ask the Palestinians, or, or, or the Emiratis, or the Saudis, anywhere. The region is tired of the, these divisions and these wars. Um, and therefore, there's plenty of fertile ground for developing peace and cooperation, uh, because simply the young generation wants to move on. Um, there is still an impetus on leadership. And I will always keep going back to that. You can't resolve problems without leadership. Um, and the Abraham Accords, in fact, are a symbol of that. So let's see that sort of leadership that President uh, Sadat showed, that the Jordanian uh, uh, King Hussein showed, that the leaders of Israel, of the United Arab Emirates, the King of Bahrain showed. Let's see that leadership uh, with others. Uh, you know, this tree of resilience is not native just to the UAE or Bahrain. It's also in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's also in Oman. Uh, it's in other parts of the region. So let's let's make, maybe make that a symbol of hope. Well, that's a great place to end, that the people's uh, willingness to live is greater than the willingness of some spoilers to die. And uh, I want to thank uh, Abdesam. I want to thank Kareem. I want to thank Zohar. I want to thank Nikolai. I want to thank you all, to all of our viewers, uh, for joining us for this policy forum. Uh, at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Thank you all very, very much.